chemistry gases, one of my favorite units in chemistry. In this section one video, we're going to describe the general properties of gases, define pressure and give the units for pressure, as well as um, practice converting between those units of pressure, and then finally relate the kinetic molecular theory to the properties of an ideal gas. So let's get started. So the first thing to understand about gases is that they are fluids. That does not mean they are liquids, gases are gases, but they are fluids, meaning that they can flow. Liquids are also, are also fluids because they can flow, um, but there are, of course, obviously some uh, big differences between gases and liquids that we will get to a little bit later. Um, but gases, um, understanding that gases are fluids and that they can flow is going to help us to better understand um, the behavior and properties of gases as we move through this lecture. So remember, gases are fluids just because they can flow. Liquids are also fluids because they can flow, but gases are not liquids. So another property of gas that we of gases that we need to keep in mind is that they have a really low density. And as you recall, our formula for density is mass over volume. So, so density is a relationship, a ratio between the mass of something and the volume of something. So for gases, the particles are so spread out uh, that they take up a whole lot of space but have a very small mass. So our mass of our gases is really small, but our volume is really big, meaning that we're going to have a low density. Additionally, uh, because they take up so much space, because they spread out, and that's due to their constant motion, gases are going to completely fill any container that they're in. So if you think about if you're in um, a large classroom, for example, let's remember back to the days when we used to attend class in classrooms. If I were to stand at the front of the classroom and spray a couple uh, sprays of perfume, and you were in the very back of the classroom, you wouldn't smell it right away. But eventually, as those perfume molecules spread out, they're going to try to fill up the entire room. In fact, they are going to fill up the entire room. They're just going to be really spread out from each other to uh, in order to do that, eventually you in the very back of the room will smell that perfume. It wouldn't be as strong as as it would have been if you were standing next to me when I sprayed that perfume because it's become more diffuse, right? The, those molecules um, went from occupying a very small volume when I first sprayed it to occupying a very large volume, but they still spread out and, uh, and took up the entire space, took up that entire room, so that even in the back of the room, you would get a faint whiff of that perfume that I sprayed in the very front of the room. So they're gonna, gases are always gonna fill up an entire container that they're in if it's a rigid container. Um, that's because they're, they're constantly bouncing. Um, and that means that gases have an undefined shape. If we are putting gases into something like a balloon with uh, flexible boundaries, then the gases, the movement of those gases is actually going to define the shape of that balloon. That's why the more you blow into a balloon, the bigger it gets because you're filling up that flexible space with more molecules. If you don't blow up it, blow it up as much, if you don't add as much air, then that, uh, then that balloon is going to be smaller. But the size of that balloon is going to be determined by how much air, how many gas molecules you put into it. If we have a rigid container, um, the volume of our gas will be equal to whatever the volume of that room or whatever that rigid container is. So another property of gas, and this is where, this is one of the properties that makes gases different from liquids, is that gases are highly compressible. Liquids, though they are fluids, so gases and liquids have that in common, this is where gases and liquids differ. Liquids are not compressible. Solids are also not compressible. Um, gases, we can compress, right? If you have a balloon, you can push on it. You'll feel that pressure increase, but you can. It is possible uh, to compress that balloon and um, kind of smush it and manipulate it. That's how we get balloon animals because of this uh, compressibility of gases. This means that gases, and this is because gases, as we mentioned, have that undefined volume. Um, and it's because, and they are compressible because we can push those, those molecules of gases together. 
So for this unit, it's all about describing and predicting the behavior of gases. And in order to describe and uh, predict the behavior of gases, we need to know four things. And those four things are we need to know the pressure, which is um, symbolized by the variable capital P, volume, which is symbolized by the variable capital V, temperature, which sorry, I don't have it on there, but is symbolized by the, uh, by the variable capital T, and the number of particles. And we're always going to, we're going to measure our number of particles of gas particles in moles, right? Because we're dealing with um, a lot of particles, a lot of very small particles, because so we're going to continue to work with them in terms of moles. And our variable for the moles of a gas is going to be lowercase n. So pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles are, um, are going to be the four things that we need to know in order to describe gas behavior and to be able to predict what gases are going to do under various conditions. So let's take a look at pressure first. So gases are all around us. Um, and uh, so air, the air around us is composed primarily of nitrogen and oxygen. So it's 70-ish percent uh, nitrogen and 20-ish percent oxygen. Um, gases all are matter, so they're made up of matter, so that means they have mass, and if they are matter and have mass, that means that Earth's gravity can pull on them. So they're also going to have a weight uh, because they are going to feel the uh, gravitational attraction of the Earth. So as they are pulled towards the Earth, and as they are in constant motion, they're going to collide with each other and the surface of the Earth. They're also, when we have gases in a container, as they move and collide uh, with each other and with the container, that's what's going to give gases their pressure. It's the collisions. So that very last bullet point that I'm sort of covering up is actually really, really important. So collisions cause air pressure. The, those molecules banging into each other and banging into the uh, sides of the container or the earth's surface, that's what's going to create air pressure. So we feel air pressure as gases and air collide with us. So you can kind of think about it like a bounce house. If our bounce house is our container and our toddlers that we put in the bounce house are our uh, gas molecules, if we just have maybe five toddlers in there, they're going to be bouncing around, hitting the walls of the bounce house, uh, hitting each other. So there's certainly going to be some pressure and several collisions. But if we're standing outside kind of feeling the outside of that bounce house, we're not going to feel a lot of pressure because there's not a ton of toddlers in there. However, if we pack that bounce house with 30 or 40 toddlers and let them go at it, um, then we're going to feel a lot more pressure on the outside of that bounce house because there's a lot more collisions. So a lot more collisions, a lot more pressure. Less collisions, less pressure. So if air pressure, gas pressure, is uh, caused by collisions, then why does air pressure increase at lower elevations and decrease at higher elevations? Well, this is because there is more atmosphere at lower elevations and less atmosphere at higher elevations. So if you're standing at sea level, you actually have much more air on top of you than you do if you're standing on top of Mount Everest. So remember we mentioned that gases are matter, so they have mass, so they're pulled on by gravity. So the closer you are to the Earth's surface, the stronger that gravitational attraction, that stronger that pull of gravity. So the Earth is going to be able to hold more gas closer to its surface. As we increase in elevation, that gravitational attraction, that gravitational, gravitational force decreases, so it just holds on to less and less gas. More gas is able to uh, escape out of our atmosphere. So as you're driving up the pulley, if you notice your ears pop, that's because as you're increasing in elevation, even though it's not a massive increase in elevation, it's enough for that difference in air pressure to be noticeable. So at uh, sea level, at the bottom of the pulley where you started, your ears have equalized the air inside your ears. So there's ear, right, there's air inside your eardrums. 
the air inside your ears is equal to, or the air pressure inside your ears is equal to the air pressure outside of your ears, right? Things like to be in equilibrium. They like to be uh, equalized. However, as you move up the poly, that air pressure around outside of you, outside of your ears decreases, which is going to cause the pressure. It's going to seem like the pressure in your ears has increased. It hasn't. It's just now higher relative to the decreasing air pressure around you. Things in nature like to go from high to low. So now as you drive up the pulley, your the air pressure in your ears is now higher than the air pressure outside. So that air at a higher air pressure wants to escape. So it's going to push out of your ears. So you're going to feel your ears pop as you feel that air escaping to equalize the pressure between uh, your eardrums and your uh, and the outside environment. So as you're driving up the pulley, the air pressure decreases because as our elevation increases, our air pressure decreases. So the air inside your ear wants to escape to equalize that pressure because things go from high to low. So that's why you feel that that pop uh, as you drive up the pulley. It's allowing, it's your ear's way of equalizing the pressure between the inside and the outside environment. This also explains why if you've ever been on a plane and you uh, brought a bag of chips and your bag of chips exploded uh, shortly after takeoff, this is why that happens as well, all because of air pressure. So the, the bag of chips was uh, filled and sealed at a much lower pressure, uh, or excuse me, a much higher pressure than the air pressure inside the plane. So the air pressure inside an air inside of an airplane cabin is actually kept a little bit lower uh, than atmospheric pressure. So uh, as you as you reach cruising altitude and the air pressure in that cabin decreases, now the air pressure inside your chip bag is greater than the air pressure outside in the airplane cabin. So that air pushes out as it's trying to escape and trying to equalize the pressure inside and outside, right, going from high to low. So if that pressure difference is enough, is high enough, uh, that bag will actually explode um, depending on what what air pressure that, that chip bag was uh, filled and sealed at. So air pressure is a magical, magical, kind of fun thing. So how do we measure pressure? So pressure is the amount of force exerted per unit area of surface. So that's key. Pressure is force per unit area. So it's the amount of force applied over a certain area. If I take my finger and I press on my palm using a certain amount of force, that's actually going to hurt more than if I took my entire hand, my entire palm, and exerted the same amount of force. My force hasn't changed but the surface area over which I'm applying that force has. In this case, I am concentrating all of that force into a small area. So I'm feeling all of that force in a concentrated area on my left hand. So it, I feel, it feels like there's more pressure, it hurts more, but it's not that there's more force, it's just that I'm concentrating that force. When I press on, when I uh, use the same amount of force but use my entire palm, I'm spreading that force out. So it doesn't feel as concentrated or as painful. This is how people are able to lay down on beds of nails and not impale themselves because they're distributing that force over a larger area uh, so they don't sink down. And because uh, additionally, because it's a large bed of nails. Um, so that, that counter force, that counter pressure, or sorry, that counter force is being spread out over a large area. If you lay down on a single nail, then yes, that nail would absolutely impale you because you're concentrating all of that force into a single point. So spread the force out and it's a lot less painful than when it's concentrated uh, into, a single, into a single point. So pressure, that's something important to remember. So for um, air pressure and for gases, our pressure is a result of collisions between our molecules and our particles. More collisions, more pressure. But pressure is the amount of force exerted per unit area. So thinking back to our bounce house example, if all of those collisions 
were uh, concentrated onto one side, I would feel more pressure. Um, I would also feel more pressure if I increase the number of collisions. So if I if I increase the amount of or if I uh, if I decrease my amount of surface area with the same amount of force, it feels like I have more pressure. And with gases, I can if I if I increase the number of collisions, I can increase pressure. But just remember, pressure takes into account not only just force, but the surface area over which that force is applied. And so for gases, we're going to measure that pressure. The tool that we're going to use to measure pressure is called the barometer. And it's actually called uh, specifically a Torricelli barometer. So this is a picture of a Torricelli barometer. It has a dish of mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And as our atmospheric pressure presses down, it's going to push that liquid mercury up into this glass tube. And on this glass tube are different um, hash, mar hash marks, hash lines, uh, that are in millimeters. So on this on this glass tube, our units are millimeters. And as our atmospheric pressure decreases, that uh, mercury inside the glass tube is going to fall. So higher atmospheric pressure means our mercury is going to go higher in the glass tube. So we're going to have a uh, our our value, our millimeters of mercury are going to be greater. We're going to have higher millimeters of mercury. And as our atmospheric pressure falls, we're going to have a lower uh, level in our tube, so we'll have a smaller number, or a smaller amount of millimeters per mercury. Or sorry, uh, millimeters of mercury. So the atmosphere extends a downward pressure on the surface of an exposed liquid, and the liquid rises up the column at an amount proportional to the downward force. So at sea level, uh, we have a one atmosphere of pressure. One atmosphere of pressure means at sea level, we are feeling the entire pre the pressure of the entire Earth's atmosphere. But there are different units that we can uh, use rather than just one atmosphere. So an atmosphere is one unit of pressure. Another unit of pressure that we actually just talked about is millimeters of mercury, right? Because on this in this glass tube, those units on our glass tube are, milli are millimeters and the liquid that we're compressing um, and moving up and down the tube is mercury. So our other one of our other units of, of pressure is millimeters of mercury. The other one of the other units is the tor, short for Torricelli, um, which is named after this entire apparatus. So our tor is named after the Torricelli barometer. And our final uh, unit of measurement is the kilopascal. So on this table it says PA up here in the top for pascals. Um, we're not going to be using pascals because that's going to make our numbers really large and unwieldy. So we're going to use kilopascals, which is small, lowercase k, ap, capital P, lowercase a. So KPA. So how these units all relate to each other? Well, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury which is equal to 760 tor. They're the same because millimeters of mercury and tor use the exact same tool, the Torricelli barometer. So one atmosphere of pressure equals 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor, which equals 101.3 kilopascals. So those are all of the, uh, let me move myself over here for a second. Those are all of the units of pressure that we're going to be uh, using. Oops, my little, my little head doesn't want to move over. Um, anyway, I think, I'm, I think I'm out of the way enough. There we go. Uh, those are the four different types of units that we're going to be using to measure our gas pressure um, and are going to be converting between. So let's take a look at how we uh, convert between these units. So for example, this asks us to convert um, two atmospheres of pressure into millimeters of mercury. So this is the same process we've been using all year, our factor label method. Sorry guys, it's not going away. So always start with what you're given. In this case, you were given two atmospheres so that's what we're going to start with. What we have goes on the bottom. What we want goes on the top. We have atmospheres. 
we need to get rid of them. So they need to go on the bottom because we need to convert. So our atmospheres go on the bottom and our millimeters of mercury, what we want, goes on the top. And then we look back to our conversion and we know that one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So our atmospheres are going to cancel. And if we do two times 760, we get 1,520 millimeters of mercury. So our conversions, if we have embraced the factor label method, um, should be very straightforward. So pause the video, try these uh, five conversions on your own. Um, do note that you might not always have a one in your conversion factor. In fact, the only one that has a one is your one atmosphere. Everything else, if you're converting between millimeters of mercury and kilopascals, 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So you may have some kind of funky numbers in your conversion factors, and that's okay. Uh, just make sure you're setting it up correctly uh, and you'll be just fine. So pause the video, give these a try, and then when you're all done, hit play, and I'll be right back with the answers so you can check your work. All right, you think you got it? Let's see. So those are the answers. Check your work, circle any that you got wrong or have questions on, and bring those questions to class, and we will review them because we want to be able to convert between our uh, different units of pressure pretty seamlessly. So one of the other uh, things that we need to know about our gases in order to predict um, and describe its behavior is volume, which we've kind of already talked about it a little bit um, when we talked about pressure. So just as a review, remember our volume is going to be determined by the molecular motion. So as those molecules are colliding with each other and uh, other surfaces, they're going to be spreading out. If it's a flexible container like a balloon, uh, the amount of gas we put in and the um, amount of motion, the speed of those molecules and how much they're able to spread out is going to influence the volume of that balloon. But if it's in a rigid container, then our gases are going to fill up that entire container no matter the size. Um, and we can change the volume on that rigid container or that flexible container because our gases are compressible. So we can change the volume um, of a gas because of the compressibility. So if it's a rigid container, the, the gases will fill up the entire container. If it's a flexible container like a balloon, uh, the volume is going to be dependent on things like the uh, amount of motion of, of the molecules. And that is going to depend on how many molecules are, are in there um, or what the kinetic energy of the molecules are. We also need to know a little bit about the temperature of our gases. So temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. So all temperature does is it gives a numeric value to the energy of motion, because that's what kinetic energy is. It gives us a numeric value to the kinetic energy of something. So if you think about a glass thermometer, how a glass thermometer works is that as the air molecules are banging against that bulb, that glass bulb, um, in our case, we use the, the ones with alcohol, right? So you've got the red, the red liquid inside your glass thermometer. As those molecules bang against the thermometer, they're transferring some of that, some of that energy inside to those uh, alcohol molecules within, within the thermometer. So eventually that uh, energy is going to be transferred. So if, it's, if the energy of the air is higher than the energy inside the uh, thermometer, that the energy of our molecules inside the thermometer is going to speed up, is going to increase. So our, our alcohol molecules are going to speed up. They're going to want to spread out and expand, and they're going to be pushed up uh, through that, up through the tube. So we'll watch our temperature rise until it gets to the point where the kinetic energy of our alcohol molecules in our thermometer are equal to uh, the energy of our air molecules outside of the thermometer. Additionally, if those, if that kinetic energy outside of the thermometer decreases, as right as it gets, we would we would think of that as it's getting colder. The kinetic energy of our outside molecules is going to decrease. The molecules inside the thermometer are, are going to want to equalize, right? Because they're now at a, at, at a higher energy 
than the molecules in the room, so from high to low. So now the energy is going to be transferred from our thermometer molecules to the outside environment. So the, the molecules in the thermometer are going to lose some energy, so that alcohol is going to fall back down. So that's how thermometers work. Uh, they're measuring the kinetic energy because as things collide, um, they are going to transfer some energy with some notable exceptions that we're going to get to in a moment. Um, so uh, temperature is the average kinetic energy of particles in a substance, and the kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And particles are in constant motion, whether they're zipping all over the place or if they're just vibrating or spinning. So temperature we're going to measure in degrees Celsius, but primarily in Kelvin, which we denote with a capital K. So degrees Celsius is based on water because we have water, we set uh, water freezing at zero degrees Celsius and water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius and just kind of fit everything in between. So Celsius is, is based on the behavior of water and Kelvin is based on absolute zero, which is a theoretical point. We've never actually gotten to this point in reality. We've gotten really, really close, but we haven't quite gotten to the point at which motion stops. But we, we've calculated that point to be at about negative 273 degrees Celsius. So in order to convert between Kelvin and Celsius, your temperature in Kelvin is equal to your degrees in Celsius plus 273. That's a really important equation to know because you're often going to have to convert between Kelvin and Celsius. So Kelvin is equal to your temperature in Celsius plus 273. All right, so finally, the kinetic molecular theory and STP. So remember, we need to know about the pressure and the volume and the temperature of gases so that we can describe, describe and predict their behavior but there's a catch. We actually can't mathematically predict the behavior of gases if they aren't ideal gases. And ideal gases are the gases that abide by the kinetic molecular theory. So ideal gases um, are going to abide by these uh, three major um, these three major components of the kinetic molecular theory or the KMT. So the KMT says that gas particles are in constant, rapid, random motion and are very far apart relative to their size. So they're very tiny, they're very, very much spread out um, and are in constant, rapid, random movement. So if they, once they collide with anything, uh, they're going to move off in, in unpredictable, random directions. Uh, it also says that gas particle collisions are perfect and lose no energy upon collisions. So when we just talked about the thermometer, the whole reason the thermometer works is because there's an energy transfer between the gas and the liquid. Because, right, we've got gases and liquids. But um, for our ideal gases that are abiding by the kinetic molecular theory, when those gas particles collide, there's no transfers, uh, transfer of energy. So when they bounce apart, they're both going to move at the same speed and have the same amount of energy that they came in with. That would be like if two cars crashed, if they were both going at 60 miles an hour and they both crashed, bounced off of each other and continued moving at 60 miles an hour just in different directions. We know in reality, when cars crash, they transfer that energy. That's why they don't keep moving. But uh, according to KM KMT, when we have ideal gases, there's going to be no transfer of energy. So they're going to continue moving on just in different directions, but they're at the same energy that they had before they collided with another particle or with um, the side of any container. Uh, the pressure, and number three, the pressure is a result of gas particle collision. So we've already covered that. Um, so those are our three main, main components of our KMT. But I should also mention, in addition um, to number two, that they travel in straight lines. Those gas particles travel in straight lines until they collide with something else. And then they're going to bounce off and continue traveling in straight lines until they collide. 
So they travel in straight lines until they collide. And then after they collide, they continue uh, moving in straight lines again, just in different directions. So in order to predict the behavior of gases mathematically, the gases have to abide by these rules. They have to abide by the rules of the kinetic molecular theory. Only ideal gases abide by these rules. And guess what? The vast majority of gases are not ideal gases. They're real gases, meaning that they are not necessarily in constant random motion. Um, maybe they're not far apart relative to their size. Maybe they're close together. There might be some energy transfer when they collide. Um, the pressure will, will likely still be a result of the particle collisions, but it's not going to be um, in a perfect, predictable way. So how on earth can we make any predictions about the behavior of gases mathematically if the majority of our gases don't abide by these rules? Well, enter STP, standard temperature and pressure. We can make real gases, we can make most gases behave like ideal gases if they're at STP, if they're at a standard temperature and pressure. So scientists have standardized conditions for reactions in order to force real gases to act like ideal gases. So for gases, STP is zero degrees Celsius or negative 263 degrees or um, excuse me, uh, zero degrees Celsius or 200, positive 273 degrees Kelvin and one atmosphere. So STP, standard temperature and pressure, zero degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. And at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, we can make real gases behave enough like ideal gases that we can predict their behavior mathematically. We can make them play by the rules. So that does it. That wraps up our uh, gases section one lecture. Make sure you filled out all of your notes. Go back and review anything you need and make sure to bring any questions you have with you to class.